<laughs> the Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's self-polishing glow coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with O.G. O'Joy. Last week on this program, I mentioned something that caused a good deal of comment. I said, a waxed house is a clean house, and a clean house is a sanitary, healthful one. Do you remember? Well, it seems that quite a few people had not fully realized that when they wax their floors, furniture, and woodwork regularly with genuine Johnson's wax, they are actually doing a good deal more than protecting and beautifying those surfaces. Yes, they're making their homes healthier as well as pleasanter places to live in. You see, the wax seals the surface against dirt and moisture. Dust and dirt do not adhere easily to a wax-polished area. So regular waxing removes many of the sources of germs. And besides, it's so much easier to clean waxed floors, baseboards, and furniture. Especially in these times, let Johnson's paste, liquid, or cream wax help keep your home sanitary and beautiful. about this time of the, quote, happy, unquote, yuletide season, every husband begins to get that cornered rat look about his eyes. But the squire of 79 Wistful Vista looks even more desperate than that. Something is definitely perturbing our hero. For further details, we join Fibber McGee and Molly. And furthermore, I'm the dumbest, short-sightedest, dim-wittedest, stumble-bummedest, empty-headedest, feather-brainest droop that ever didn't know enough to come in out of a tornado. Well, just as you say... If my head was small enough to fit my brains, I'd be getting telegrams from Ripley. Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. You say Washington's home at Mount Vernon has got a beautiful big stoop, but you got a bigger and a beautifuler stoop, and I don't mean anybody but me. <laughs> ah, you just say that. Ah, I got the, <laughs> got the IQ of a microbe. I think when I die, I'll leave my skull to the Smithsonian for a doorknob. <laughs> How charming. As dumb as I am, it's a wonder to me I ever got out of the third grade. <laughs> it's a wonder to me you ever got in. <laughs> you ain't whistling Dixie there either, sister. <laughs> I think I'll give myself back to the Indians. I'm the biggest numbskull that ever... All could... right, McGee. I'll admit you're a fascinating subject, but what's this all about? It's about me. That's what it's all about. I'm the stupidest... Dumb... All right, all right. Mm. For the sake of argument, let's say you're completely brainless. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'll find it sooner or later. Find what? <laughs> At 15 bucks. I was saving it for your Christmas present. I hid it last summer, so I wouldn't be tempted to spend it, and now I can't find it. If that don't make me the weak mind Now, dumb... now, 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 stop pacing up and down. Ours is a beautiful union, and it doesn't need any pickets. <laughs> pickets are still laying there. <laughs> and I'm getting desperate. Only eight more shopping days before Christmas, and I've looked every place. Calm yourself. What man can hide, man can find. Yeah... Where do you usually hide your extra money? I don't usually have any extra money. <laughs> but when I did, I used to put it in the sugar bowl. Did you look there? Yes, but I'm using it now to keep stuff more valuable than money. Why? Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> did you go through all your old clothes? Yeah, but it wouldn't be there. I distinctly remember tucking it away in some safe place. Ah, oh, let me see. Where could I... Hey, hand me that blue vase on the mantel. Oh, this one here? Yeah. Oh, no, it ain't here. <laughs> This is where I've been keeping my cellophane collection. <laughs> sure got a mess of it, haven't I? What are you saving cellophane for? I don't know. I guess I just got tired of collecting cigar bands. 
string. <laughs> Seemed to be more future in cellophane. <laughs> Doggone it, this makes me sore. Was it in $5 bills, dearie? It was a 10 and a 5 in a white envelope. And I wrote on the outside of it, do not touch until 10 days before Christmas, and this means me. <laughs> Well, I'm a pretty good housekeeper, if I do say so myself, and I haven't seen anything of it. Well, if the worst comes to worst, I'll, I'll get an internal revenue collector in here. <laughs> Them guys could find money in a caraway seed. <laughs> now, let me think a minute. If I could just remember... Come in. Abigail Luppington. Hello, darling. Oh, how do you do, my dear? And Mr. McGee. Hi, Uppy. Where's your Santa Claus costume? Or aren't you christening the Kringle today? <laughs> I don't go on duty till four o'clock, Mr. McGee. <laughs> but what, may I ask, is the matter with you? What do you mean, Abigail? Well, look at him, my dear. Uh, he looks positively haggard. <gasps> I only hope the government doesn't catch him with those Chevrolet tires under his eyes. <laughs> I ain't been sleeping good, Uppy. I got pernicious insomnia. I'm worried. Yes, he had $15 for Christmas shopping, Abigail, and now he can't find it. For three days now, he's been prowling around the house like a mouse after a cat. You mean a cat after a mouse? In this house, anything can happen. <laughs> I had a case like that once. Uppy, you sound ozier than Nelson. <laughs> what happened with you? Oh, I was simply frantic because I thought I'd mislaid a ruby and emerald bracelet. But the solution was so simple, it was ridiculous. Well, what was the solution? Maybe it'll give McGee an idea. I suddenly realized I had never had a ruby and emerald bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wasn't that silly? And I thought I was dumb. <laughs> Luffy, you're as giddy as a steeplejack full of applejack. <laughs> I was at that time, Mr. McGee. You see, I was just a girl out of finishing school and madly in love with a handsome young lieutenant. Oh, ah, well, there was something awfully romantic about those Civil War uniforms, Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, they certainly were. I, I beg your pardon, Mr. McGee. Don't mention it, Abigail. But uh, what girls' school did you go to? Oh, uh, Ward Belmont, my dear, in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh. oh, I can close my eyes now and smell the magnolias on the campus. That's my hair, Uppy. I just come from the barber shop. <laughs> and it is magnolia. It's jockey club. Well, do remind me, my dear, sometime to show you the pictures of my class. I was captain of the croquet team, you know. No. Mm -hmm. Well, call me Virginia and watch me reel. <laughs> so you all were the captain of the croquet team, was you, honey child? Ah, uh, please, Mr. McGee. I have only the most charming memories of the South, and I found Southern men were always most gentlemanly. Hmm. Well, I guess that'll dim your northern lights, McGee. <laughs> That's, that must account for my good manners, Uppy. My grandfather wore the southern uniform, you know. Oh, really? Sure. Yeah. He was a conductor on the Chattanooga Choo Choo after <laughs> What was it you wanted to see me about? Oh, I just wanted to tell you about the most marvelous fortune teller. Fortune teller? Blah. Those bargain basement gypsies couldn't foretell the future of a blue-eyed blonde with the fleet in. Oh. <laughs> Ah, fun my clavicle. Dark man going to cross your path, going to take a long journey, going to get a letter. You'll find your diamond ring under the... Hey, maybe she can tell me where my 15 bucks is. Come on, what are we waiting for? Get your hat, Molly. Where is this fortune teller, Uppy? It's upstairs, though. Never mind, I'll find it. Come on, Molly. We'll see you later, Uppy. Why didn't I think of this before? Oh, boy, that 15 bucks is as good as found. Right now. Why, those people are wonderful. I know of a case where a guy lost a bass drum once and those...
get a load of this reception room, Molly. Boy, what a dump. Well, this was your idea, not mine. Well, why do fortune tellers always live in joints like this? If they can see into the future, why don't they make a killing at the races and live in a classy apartment? <laughs> well, maybe they can't get a crystal ball big enough to see a horse in. <laughs> Well, this one sure ought to know her onions. She's cooked enough of them around here. Don't be so critical. You know, Madam X ought to be calling us in any time now. You know, we've been waiting here 25 minutes. Madam X. Probably an old gypsy named McGillicuddy. <laughs> Not that I care what her name is, if she can slap herself into a trance and find my 15 bucks. You know, we'd have saved time if we just consulted Uncle Dennis. Ah, what does he know about fortune telling? Well, I don't know, but he certainly lives in an atmosphere of departed spirits. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last night I came into the hall and I found him balancing himself on the banister. Yeah? What did he say? He said, niece, your escalator has run down. <laughs> At it again, huh? I gave him a lecture about that just the other day. What'd he do? He just sat tight. <laughs> oh, uh oh Mr. McGee, I will see you now, please. Oh, oh, thank you, madam. Come on, dearie. We'll see what fate has in store for you. If fate still has a store, which I doubt with things being so hard to get. <laughs> well, I'm ready, sis. Hop onto your broomstick. This way, please. Mm. Oh, incense. <laughs> I think I preferred the onions. <laughs> hey, can't we have a little light in here, sis? No. The darkness, she is desirable for proper contact with the forces of the unknown. Oh. Sit down, please. Oh, thank you. Wow. <laughs> you see, the reason we came, Madam X, is because... Do not tell me. I will tell you. Your husband is in trouble, no? My husband is in trouble, yes. <laughs> uh, hey, how'd you know, sis? Can you read my mind? Yes. It is very simple. Huh? Oh. <laughs> no, that's what he's been telling himself all day, madam. How do we go about this now, sis? Do you read the stars, feel the bumps on my head, look at my palm, or do we just sit around and strain our eyes at each other? No. For five dollars, I will answer three questions. Five dollars? Isn't that a little expensive? Yes. Now you have two more questions. <laughs> We better not waste any time, Molly. Here's a question, sis. Where's the 15 bucks I was saving for my wife's Christmas present? It is right where you are putting it. <laughs> now, you have one more question. Heavenly days. We're not making much progress, are we? No. Now, for another five dollars, I will answer three more questions. <laughs> Oh, no, you don't, sis. Come on, Molly. I ain't going to pay her ten bucks to find fifteen. Here, sis, here's your five dollars. Thank you. You must come again and see Madame X when you are troubled with business, law, or marriage. Who, us? Do we look that silly? Do you think we like to be gypped? That is three more questions. <laughs> I will answer the first one by come saying... Come on, Molly, come on. <laughs> well, my goodness, McGee. We didn't get much satisfaction in there, did we? Well, yes. She at least says that dough is still where I put it. <laughs> That's some comfort. Well, come on, let's go home and well, see... Well, hello there, folks. Say, have you been consulting Madam X? Yes, if you call it that, Mr. Wilcox. The way that dame clips you, she ought to be a barber in a boot camp. <laughs> You going to consult her, Junior? Sure. I was in here last week for advice. About what? Oh, business. I asked her how the future of Johnson's Wax stacked up. She said it had a very bright and sparkling future. Oh. She said that in times like these, when conservation was so important, more housewives than ever would preserve and protect their floors with Johnson's Wax. And what was the second question, my fellow chump? <laughs> well, then I asked her which of the Johnson Wax features I should emphasize, and she said health. Because Johnson's Wax seals the surface against dust and dirt and dampness and gives the housewife so much extra rest and leisure. Oh, and the third question? That's where I made my mistake. I asked her if my pipe bothered her. And she said yes and soaked you another fin. <laughs> Boy, what a racket. Say, why on earth are you coming back, Mr. Wilcox, if you knew you'd been cheated? I want to ask her if she took my watch. <laughs> Mr. Wilcox, I will see you now. I'll say you will, baby. So long, folks. What? <laughs> well, let's get on home, McGee. We'll turn the house inside out and we'll find that $15. And believe me, the next time I hide something, I'm going to hide it in plain sight. This will teach me a lesson. If I wasn't such a sap-headed, beetle-brained, black-eared, low-browed, withering...
but it's tricks I ever heard of anything. Well, like now that we're home, home, where'd we better start, McGee? Oh, I don't know. I remember putting it in a place where I could lay hands on it at a minute's notice. You say the $15 was in a white envelope? Yes. Well, that shouldn't be so hard to find. Would you put it behind one of the pictures? No, I looked behind all the pictures this morning. I turned Whistler's mother around so many times she almost fell out of her chair. <laughs> Say, maybe you put it under a rug. No, I've had them up too many times. I'd have seen it. Oh, why can't I remember? I must have a skull full of rice pudding. I'm the biggest drip this side of Niagara Falls. The only thing that keeps my ears apart is my big fat mouth. Oh. <laughs> no, no, McGee. Anybody can forget things. Nobody you... can forget them as easy as me. It's exasperating. I'm getting so I'm afraid to shake hands for fear I'll walk off without my arm. <laughs> Here, I thought I was a pretty bright guy. And I couldn't pass the intelligence test of a Mongolian basket weaver. Oh, Why have all now, the for couple? goodness sakes, if you'd stop scolding yourself for a few minutes, maybe we could get something done. Ah, uh, well, my gosh, well... Now, listen, it. here's what we better do. I'll start with the upstairs and go through every room. Yeah. And you look around down here. And between us, we ought to cover every inch of this house. Okay, but I... Now, can... now, now, stop your arguing. Anyway, you're not as dumb as you claim. You're really pretty smart. Uh, I am? Yes. Oh. Or you wouldn't have hidden that $15 from yourself. <laughs> Why, when it comes to money, and I hope we do... Come in. Oh, hello there, Mr. Oldtimer. Hello, daughter. Hello, Johnny. I just stopped in to say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> hey, Oldtimer, come back here. What's the matter, kid? You can't yell goodbye at us and then rush away like that. Where are you going and for how long? Yeah, and when will you be back and for how long? Going to Chicago, kids. Going to be gone for an indefinite period. Oh, what do you mean, indefinite period? I mean, I won't be back till the afternoon of January 5th. But whether 3 o'clock or 3.15 is indefinite. <laughs> Fly? Hey! Fly! Oh, well, I'll hold still and you swat him, Jenny. <laughs> no, my husband means, are you going to fly to Chicago or take the train? Ain't decided, daughter. Thought maybe I'd get up early in the morning, throw the saddle on old Betsy, leap on her back and ride her all the way to Shy. Well, that's a long trip for a horse. Who's a horse? Why, isn't Betsy? No, Betsy's my bicycle. <laughs> On the other hand, kids, I likely take the seam cars. I love trains. Used to be a railroad man in my younger days. What'd you do on the railroad? What do you mean, what did I do, Johnny? I had my own. You mean you owned a railroad? Sure did, daughter. 18 cars, two engines, and 72 foot of track. Run from the dining room through the front hall, back to the kitchen, and round into the dining room again. <laughs> Stopped at the umbrella stand, the piano stool, the refrigerator, and the cook, except on Mondays, which was the cook's day off, and at the piano stool on signal only. But I had a bad wreck in 1889 when Papa come home late one night, tripped over the coal car. Oh, tough luck. Ah, uh, yes. Now I never see an engine with a tender behind without thinking of what Papa did to me that night. <laughs> well, so long, kids. Merry Christmas. Men sing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. for 
Christmas. I'm about ready to give up. You certainly hit that $15 well. Yes, and I could kick myself around the block for it, too. If I'm not the silliest Yes, dumb... yes, we've been all over that. Are you sure you had $15 in the first place? Sure, I'm sure. A ten and a five. And they were earmarked for your Christmas present, too. They were what? Earmarked. That's what the government does with money, so that's what I do. How? Well, I put ink all over my ears and pressed both bills against them. <laughs> I think the theory is that no two people have ears alike. <laughs> you know, like fingerprints, only easier to see. Well, that must keep Mr. Morgenthau pretty busy. Yeah, I guess it does. Now, listen, let's just sit down here and reconstruct what you did when you hid the money. What did you do first? Well, first, I got me an envelope. Come in. Whose car is that out in front? The black one? Well, that's a kind of a combination ownership, bud. Me and the finance company... I see you have an ace sticker on the windshield. Do you do any pleasure driving? Take him for a ride around the block, McGee. That'll answer that question. <laughs> in that car, sir, you get more pleasure walking. And I don't quite understand Let what... me see your draft registration card, please. Okay, here you are, bud. I'm not only a little overage, but I got a lot of collateral dependence. I got collateral at the First National, the Morris Plan, the building in... Caroline! How much coffee have you got? Oh, well, uh, about a half a pound. Sugar? No, thanks, just cream. <laughs> now, look here, bud. I don't mind answering questions. McGee, this is war. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, we read about it in the papers, but why I only not... have a few more questions, then I'm through. Have you been buying war bonds? But we've been buying war bonds till we're red, white, and blue in the face. And I've licked the back of so many war-saving stamps, everything I eat tastes like glue. Now, if you don't mind... I hope you're not complaining. Certainly we complain. Everybody complains, and it doesn't mean a thing. And now, if you'll please explain Maggie, why... I see you have cuffs on those trousers. Did you buy that suit after restrictions were put on clothing? No, I didn't. While I don't like to be personal, bud, there are still a few people who need a cup on the pants. So will you please tell us just who you... Just one more thing. The government doesn't want you to buy anything you don't need. They're trying to keep prices at a reasonable level, encourage buying bonds and paying off debts. We want this country to be on a sound financial footing after this war is over. Now remember that. Just what is your connection with the government? Oh, my goodness, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Mr. Tolliver. I just moved into the brick house down the street. Oh, I'm glad to know you, Tolliver. This is my wife, huh? How do you do, I'm sure. Just what department of the government are you in, Mr. Tolliver? Oh, I'm not in the government, Mrs. McGee. I run the hamburger wagon down there at 14th and Oak. And I must say, we serve the well, finest... Well, Dad, Brad, what why do you got come busting in here and asking all them silly questions? Well, I think when a man moves into a new neighborhood, he naturally wants to know all about his neighbors. Certainly is nice to have met you folks. Good night. <laughs> nervy people I well, ever tells met. me I'm going to have trouble with that mug. <laughs> He's going to get in my hair and there ain't enough room in it for anybody but me. <laughs> A self-appointed cop. Oh, huh? never mind, McGee. Let's concentrate on finding your $15. Now, what did you do after you got the envelope? Well, now, let me think. I put the money in the envelope and sealed it. Yes. Then I started looking for a hiding place. Yes. First, I thought I'd hide it in the hall closet. And then I says to myself, no, I says, I'm going to clean out that closet one of these days. <laughs> so I take the envelope. Oh, for goodness sakes. Come in. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Mr. McGee. <laughs> oh, Mr. Wimp. Hi, Wimp, old man. Why the suitcase? You running away from home again? Oh, no, Miss McGee. I'm going to Chicago on a business trip for about three weeks. Oh, <laughs> is your wife going with you, Mr. Wimple? No, she isn't, Mrs. McGee. I'm going to be terribly lonesome without her, too. Ouch. What's the matter? <laughs> I was crossing my fingers so hard I almost broke them. <laughs> well, uh, what kind of a business trip is this, Mr. Wimple? I'm going to see my publishers, Mrs. McGee, the ones who publish all my poetry. Oh. They sent me a telegram saying they wanted to see me. Gee, they must think a lot of you, Wimp. <laughs> yes, they wanted to publish my picture, and I sent them some, and they wired right back. We don't believe it, come in person. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? So you won't be here for Christmas, Mr. Wimple? No, but Sweetie Face gave me my Christmas present before I left. 
Look, a check for $25. Say, that's great, Wimp. Isn't it, though? Mm. She says if I'm a good boy all year, that next Christmas she'll sign it. <laughs> she might even throw in the blotter. Oh, that old saber tooth. I thought of a swell gift I'd like to send her, Wimp, but I hate to ask anybody to deliver it. Oh, I'd be very happy to take it over, Mr. McGee. Oh, no, you wouldn't. It might explode before you got there. <laughs> Now, if you timed it right to the second. Now, <laughs> uh, what did you give your wife for Christmas, Mr. Wimple? A great big bottle of cologne, Mrs. McGee, to be opened on Christmas morning. Cologne, eh? What kind, Wimp? I mixed it up myself, Miss oh. McGee. Mostly carbolic acid. <laughs> oh, why, Mr. Wimple, that's liable to take the skin right off her face. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Three weeks away from that gunner's mate of his, and Wimp will be a new man. Poor little fella. I'll be a poor little fella myself if I don't find that 15 bucks. If I wasn't such a numbskull, such a hopeless dope and a blue ribbon dude, oh, I'm Oh, stop a... it now. Huh? Let's take up where we left off. Okay. After you decided against hiding it in the closet, what'd you do? Doggone it, that's what I can't remember. All I know is I put it someplace where I'd remember it just before Christmas. Well, I'm sorry, McGee. I can't imagine where in the Dickens you... Dickens! That's it. Now I remember. Here it is, right here in this book. What book? Dickens' Christmas Carol. Whatever made you hide your money in that? Safest place in the world. Nobody ever opens that book till Christmas time. <laughs> Winter weather is hard on our floors, we might as well admit it. When snow and slush and wet get tracked in, the floor surfaces need the protection of a tough coat of Johnson's Wax. If you examined a waxed floor under a magnifying glass, you'd see that it's the wax that gets all the wear. The surface underneath is safe. And don't forget that with genuine Johnson's Wax, you can touch up heavy traffic spots whenever necessary without having to re-wax the entire floor. Don't forget either that there are 100 extra labor-saving uses for wax around your home. Windowsills, Venetian blinds, luggage, shoes and boots, furniture and woodwork. In these times when we have to take better care of the things we have, wax is a helpful ally. That was a kind of a clever son at that, hiding this 15 bucks in Dickens' Christmas Carol. (laughs) Maybe I ain't such a fool after all. No, (laughs) you really have some bright moments, McGee. Yeah, I guess I do at that. Well, all's well that ends well. (laughs) Here, you keep the 15 bucks for me. I gotta throw this envelope in the wastebasket. (laughs) Well, this isn't $15. This is the envelope. Huh? Oh, my gosh. I tore up the money. What? Ah, if I ain't the worst (laughs) muddle-headed. More than ever should have had 15 bucks in the first place. I'm the dumbest dim-witted as dumb... Ah, good night. Good night, (laughs) all. The characters of the old-timer and Wallace Wimple heard on our program were played by Bill Thompson. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax Finishes for the home and industry... Inviting you all to join us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.